Now, as the Apostle John lived out his exile on the Isle of Patmos, he inevitably, along with many others, would have been worried about the future, uh, concerned in particular about the future of the church. It's towards the end of the first century, and John is one of the last witnesses to Jesus who's still alive. Um, so soon there wouldn't be anyone alive who had actually been with Jesus or seen Jesus or heard Jesus. Uh, soon all living links to Jesus would be dead. Uh, not only that, but uh, the church currently is being heavily persecuted, both by Rome and by the Jews. On top of that, there were troubles in the church. There was false teaching, there was error, there was sin, there was immorality, there was compromise. And on top of that, uh, the world itself was a troubled place. Uh, so, for example, in AD 69, um, after Nero, the emperor, had committed suicide, uh, there was a, a, a power vacuum, and in the space of just one year, Rome had four emperors, as di different people fought with each other uh, to try and seize power and control. Uh, then, of course, there was the brutal siege of Jerusalem in AD 70, something that would live long in the memory of the Jews, as over a million Jews were killed, all meaning that as the first century came to a close, it felt like the future of everything was uncertain. And it was into that uncertain future that God gave to the church, through the Apostle John, this incredibly important book, the book of Revelation, this final book of the Bible. A book full of symbolic pictures and colors and numbers and metaphors given by God to teach the church how to see the world from heaven's perspective. A book given to encourage and comfort the first century Christians and us today in relation to the future and God's purposes for the church and the world. Now in chapter 4 we saw that God is seated on the throne. And we saw that the throne of heaven, it dominates and it towers over everything else in the world. God is in control. In chapter 5, we saw that in God's right hand is a scroll that has been sealed with seven seals. Now, what is this scroll? It is God's plan of judgment and salvation. It contains all of God's purposes for the universe. It's God's book of destiny. And it has the glory of God and the salvation of his people and the complete judgment of his enemies as its end goal. Uh, we saw Jesus, the lion lamb, go to the one who is seated on the throne and take the scroll from his right hand. And we watched as everyone worshipped Jesus, the whole of heaven, when they saw the scroll, the book of destiny, in his nail-pierced hands. Jesus is in control. And now in chapter 6, we watch with John as Jesus opens the seals of the scroll and brings God's plans to pass. Now you will notice that the seals are divided into two units. So the first four seals, they make up one unit, and the second three seals, which contain more detail, make up another unit, with there being a, a glorious and wonderful and rich interlude, chapter 7, between the 6th and the 7th seal. The 7th seal is at the beginning of chapter 8. And so as we look at chapter 6 this morning, we start with verses 1 to 8 and the heading, the disasters. Uh, we start with the first four seals, verses 1 to 8, and we're going to think about these disasters. When Jesus opens the first four seals, four horsemen are unleashed on the earth. And our focus turns from what's happening in heaven to what is going on on the earth. As some people describe these um, horsemen as the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And, and this is not the first time they've been spoken about in the Bible. If you were to go back to the Old Testament and, and Zechariah and chapter 1 and 6, you find that they have their roots there. Verse 1, Jesus opens the first seal of the scroll. 
And one of the four living creatures with a voice like thunder issues a summons and the first horse appears. Verse 2, and, Jesus, and, and John says, and I looked, and look, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Now, there's been an enormous amount of ink that has been used and spilt as people have tried to work out who they think this horseman is. As some think, many think, that this is Christ. Uh, this horseman is determined to conquer, and the word conquer in the book of Revelation is almost always linked with Jesus. Um, if you've read chapter 19 before, you will know that Jesus there is pictured riding on a white horse, and he wears lots of crowns, and he conquers. Uh, white in the Bible is normally symbolic of holiness and goodness and purity. And so many people think that this is Jesus. Uh, but I don't think that it can be Jesus. Uh, if you look at how these four horsemen are described, both, both here and in Zechariah 6, you will see that instead of taking them separately, you're supposed to take them together. Uh, they are a collective. They are one unit. They belong together. And if that's so, this can't be Jesus, because the other three horsemen, they bring evil rather than good. They bring suffering rather than salvation. Now, there are other details to suggest that this is not Jesus. So, for example, this rider has a bow, whereas in Revelation 19, Jesus has a sword. Uh, this has led some people to thinking, well, this must be the Antichrist then, uh, pretending to be the Christ, causing all sorts of damage while spreading false teachings. But I don't think this is the Antichrist either. I think that this horseman simply stands for what this horseman is determined to do. End of verse 2, conquer. This horseman stands for conquest. Now, this horseman represents the cruel and violent ambitions that people and nations have to conquer others. Now, that thirst for power and victory and domination that stems from pride and greed and selfishness. Now, the color white in the Bible does often represent holiness and goodness, but it can also represent conquest and victory. Now, when a general won a victory against a city, he would often ride into the city on a white horse, and that white horse would be sending a message to the city, uh, to the citizens, telling them that they were a conquered people, they were a defeated people. Uh, what color is the flag that you raise when you surrender? It's a white flag. And so this first rider is conquest. Uh, Jesus opens the second seal, verse 3, and the summons is issued, and a second horse gallops out. Uh, this horse is bright red. Uh, what happens when people have the desire to conquer others? War normally follows. And that's exactly what this horseman represents. He symbolizes war. He's given a great sword. And he's allowed by God, verse 4, to take away peace. And as a result, people want to kill each other. And so armies are mobilized. And weapons are used. And conflict happens. Verse 5. Jesus opens the third seal. And the third horse is summoned. Uh, this horse is black, and its rider symbolizes poverty and inflation. Uh, he holds a pair of scales in his hand as he measures out food and sells food for, for prices that have just gone through the roof. Uh, one, denarius is, uh, one denarius was one day's wages, and so if you look there, it, it means that, that, that in this situation, food has become so expensive that they're having to use all their wages just to be able to buy their basic needs. Uh, one person has estimated that the prices here are 12 times what they should be normally. So, so you imagine spending £17 for a loaf of bread 
or going to fill up your car with fuel and just one litre costs 18 pounds, or or buying a pint of milk for 12 pounds. That's the kind of prices, inflation, that is here. Uh, the, the, The picture that we're given here, combined with the oil and wine, are still being available for the wealthy. It's, it's not quite one of starvation or famine, but it is one of real economic difficulty. And, and this is exactly what happens when nations go to war. So even here in the UK in the last couple of years, uh, the cost of living has gone up because of, of wars that have been taking place elsewhere in the world. And you think, well, if prices have gone up here when we're not at war, think of what the prices must be like for people who are living in places like uh, Gaza or the Ukraine. And Jesus opens the fourth seal, verse 7, and the fourth horse is summoned. Uh, This horse is a pale horse, and this rider symbolizes death. And you notice that the place of the dead follows hard on his heels. He's given uh, authority over a quarter of the earth to kill by a variety of means. And you notice the logical sequence between the four horsemen. So when someone is determined to conquer someone else, war usually follows. And when there's war, there is almost always a scarcity of food and shelter and clothing. Uh, bringing death not just to those who are on the front line, uh, but also to others who are suffering because of it. And, and so when you read your news feeds today, uh, when you're watching the news, what you should be thinking about in your mind is Revelation and chapter 6. What you should be seeing on your TV screens as you're watching the news is these, these four horses galloping across your screen. At the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Palestine, at the tensions between Lebanon and Israel, China and Taiwan, at the civil wars that are going on in Ethiopia and Myanmar. Uh, The desire to conquer others, the invasions, the weapons, the fighting, the devastation, the displaced peoples, the refugee camps, the inflation, uh, the the deaths, uh, the, the mass funerals. These are all a result of Jesus opening the four seals, the first four seals of this book of destiny. And before we move on, And let me underline three things. Firstly, see how clearly these things show that God is in control. See how clearly these things show that God is in control. I think sometimes when we see all of the wars going on in the world, the conclusion that we are attempted, where we're tempted to come to is is that actually God has lost control. And that yes, God has a plan, but things are not going according to plan. And yet actually, what is happening is, is is that Jesus himself is bringing these things to pass. So so, so all these wars going on in the world, they're not happening in spite of God's plan, they're happening because of God's plan. They're happening in fulfillment of God's plan. It is, it is God who is bringing these things to pass. Now, you remember that Jesus told his disciples before he went to the cross that there would be wars and rumors of wars. Now, God is not the author of sin. He's not the author of evil. But he is permitting these things to happen, and he is using them to fulfill his plans. And we see here in the detail how clearly God is in control. So so have a look at verse 4. It is God who permits peace to be taken away. Have a look at verse 6. It is God who's protecting the oil and the wine. Have a look at verse 8. It is God who is limiting the suffering on the earth to a quarter. God is in control. 
Secondly, see how this underlines God's grace in restraining evil. See how this underlines God's grace in restraining evil. Uh, If you look at what happens when these first four seals are opened, uh, you, you will see that they all find their origin in the fallout of Adam and Eve and humanity's rebellion against God. And, and a really good question to ask ourselves is, is, is not why are there so many wars going on in this world, but rather why is there any peace at all? That is what should surprise us. That is what should out, uh, astound us. It's, it's, it's not that there are so many wars. That shouldn't surprise us. What should surprise us is that there is any peace at all. Uh, Why is there any peace? Why do we have peace here in the UK? It's because of God's restraining grace. As he holds back the forces of evil and he limits the effects of our sin. Uh, Look again at verse 6. How there is economic hardship but not complete famine. Have a look at verse 8, how it's a quarter of the world that suffers in this way, but not the whole world. God, in his grace, he's holding back the forces of evil, and he's restraining um, our sin. And, And yet what you will find is, however, as you read through the book of Revelation, as I understand it, is that is that as time goes by and you get closer and closer to the end, God allows these things to increase and intensify. So you have the vision of the seven seals here. You will read on, and in chapters eight and nine, you will have the vision of the seven trumpets. And then later on, I think it's in chapter 16, you have the vision of the seven bowls. Now, I think those three visions are all about the same thing. They're all about God's purposes for judgment and salvation in this world. They're just coming at things from different angles. And yet what you find is in those visions, things increase and intensify. So here in the vision of the seven seals, it's a quarter of the world that suffers. In the vision of the seven trumpets, it's a third of the earth that suffers. And then when you get to the vision of the seven bowls, the whole earth suffers. And and it's, it's reminding us here, why is there any peace at all? It's because God in his grace is restraining the forces of evil. God in his grace is limiting the impact of our sin and then and then a third thing to underline and that is that these are mini judgments and what is being described here are mini judgments so the bible describes the period that we're living in today as the last days Uh, the period between the first coming of jesus and the second coming of jesus we are living in the last days And one day Jesus is going to return in all of his holy glory and he's coming to judge the whole world. And so as we see these things happening all around us and as we hear of them being reported on the news, what is happening is we are in these mini judgments but we are being reminded that there is an ultimate judgment to come. As, as we see what sometimes seems to be like hell on earth, we are being warned about the day when ultimate hell will be experienced. These are mini judgments. And in these mini judgments, God is warning us about the ultimate judgment that will one day come and the need for people to be ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I ask you, are you ready? Are you listening to the warnings? Are you responding to them in the way that you should? Our second heading, verses 9 to 11, is the martyrs. The martyrs. Jesus opens the fifth seal, and the focus switches back to what's happening in heaven. 
And John, he sees the souls of those who have been killed for their faith in Jesus, and he sees them under the altar. Uh, the altar in the temple courtyard was where animal sacrifices were made in worship to God. And, and these are Christians who have made the, the ultimate sacrifice to God. They've um, laid down their lives for the Lord and, and their willingness to die for the Lord and not to deny their faith is an act of worship. And you think of what things were like for some of the Christians in the first century. You think of some of those Christians who were thrown to the wild animals in the amphitheaters. Or you think of some of those Christians who were used as flaming torches to light the streets of Rome. Now, this was a reality for them. And although Christians in the UK are relatively safe and we don't expect to have to die for our faith as we live in this country, it is said that more Christians have been killed in the last century than in the previous 19 centuries combined. And in verse 10, they echo the Old Testament cry of how long? O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now, it's not that these martyrs don't want their killers to find forgiveness with God. It's, it's not that they have harder hearts than Stephen, who, when he was being martyred, and prayed to the Father and asked the Father not to count their sin against them. It's rather that, that as they find themselves in the burning presence of a sovereign God who is just and holy, they cannot reconcile in their minds the fact that he is perfectly just, and yet these people are getting away with evil. It, it just doesn't add up to them. It doesn't make sense to them. Each are given a white robe that symbolizes their righteousness, and they're told to rest and be at peace until all of God's people who are still to be martyred have been martyred. So you see again that God is in control. He's in control even over the number of his people who will be killed for the faith. And God is waiting for that number to be completed until he comes again in final judgment. And that's what gives the martyrs rest. That's what gives the martyrs peace. Being reminded that this is all part of God's plan and that God is in complete control and things haven't gone awry and that justice will one day come. And as we see these martyrs in heaven, it makes me ask the question, how burdened am I, how burdened are you by the suffering of our brothers and sisters around this world? So for example, when was the last time that I got down on my knees and cried out to God, how long? How long would my brothers and sisters have to suffer like this for? When was the last time that, that you cried out to God with feeling, how long? And when things don't add up or things don't make sense, are we able to rest in God and his character and in his plans for the future? And as we see our brothers and sisters around the world paying the ultimate price with their lives for their faith in Jesus. How willing are we to pay a price for being a Christian, whether it's in our families or our workplaces or our neighborhoods? These martyrs, they've paid the ultimate price. And so we come finally, verses 12 to 17, to the end. Verses 12 to 17, the end. When Jesus opens the sixth seal of the scroll, this heralds the arrival of the day of judgment. And when Jesus opens the seventh seal at the beginning of chapter 8, and there is silence in heaven for half an hour, I understand that to be describing the activity of judgment taking place. The whole of humanity standing in silence before God, every mouth stopped. 
Here we have the arrival of the day of judgment. And it's a great question to ask, isn't it? What is it going to be like on the day of judgment? And do you ever think about that from time to time? What is it going to be like on the day of judgment? What is it going to be like for you? You think of how nervous you might feel as your school exams approach and you're only a few days from your exams and you're just not sure whether you're going to be ready or not for your exam and you feel really nervous and stressed about it. Or, or, or you think maybe how worried you feel about the fact that you've got some hospital, hospital test results to find out and you're, you're just not sure what the news is going to be, whether it's going to be good or bad. You don't know what the diagnosis is going to be and you feel more and more nervous as you, as you wait for that phone call or you have to go and visit the hospital. Uh, you think about even, it's just such a small thing, but you, you think about sometimes even if you've got the dentist and you, you can feel a bit nervous sometimes. Well, well if, if you feel nervous about these things, what about this? What about the awesome day of God's judgment? You see firstly in verses 12 to 14 that, that when the day of judgment comes, the whole of the universe is going to be affected. All of this imagery is found in the Old Testament. Now John speaks of a massive earthquake. Now you've seen earthquakes on the news. Maybe you've been caught up in one where buildings collapse and people, they are screaming and they are running about and, and the, the ground, the solid ground beneath their feet is, is opening up and it's disappearing. And yet this earthquake is so big that it, it just goes off the Richter scale. In this vision, the sun turns black and the moon blood red. Now, these are colors that speak of terror and judgment. Now, the frightening power of God is so awesome and spectacular that even the stars are shaken from the sky in the same way that a storm might shake the fruit from a tree. Mountains are just going to be gone. Islands are going to be taken away. And as easily as you would roll up a piece of paper, God is going to roll up and remove the sky. Even the sky is going to be taken away. This really is the end. Everything is going to be shaken. Everything that you know, everything that you see, everything that you touch is going to be shaken. The solid ground, the mountains, the sky... You see, everything outside of Jesus that you are tempted to put your confidence in, it's going to be shaken and it's going to be taken away. You see, secondly, verses 15 to 17, that the whole of humanity will be held to account. Whether you're a king or a celebrity or an army general whether you've got loads of money, whether you've got loads of influence, everyone, slave and free, each have to face God's judgment. No one is let off. No one escapes. No one is excused. No one is able to, to buy their way out. And no one is able to pull a few strings and be let off. Everyone has to face God's judgment. And, and look at what people are doing. As such is the frightening nature of this day that people, they are hiding in caves and they are crying out, they are begging for the mountains to fall on them and hide them. They are terrified and, and they just want to be hidden. And, and why are they terrified? Verse 16 is because they can't cope with the face of the one who is seated on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. You know, one of the reasons why this day will be so terrifying is because of the wrath of the lamb. Lambs are supposed to be sweet and nice and harmless and gentle. They are not meant to frighten people. But this lamb will. You see, Jesus, he's been so kind to people. 
He's been so gentle with people. He's been so patient with people. Jesus, he's loved people so much that he has laid down his life and he's become this sin-bearing sacrifice as a substitute for people so that they can be forgiven. And, and people, they've just rejected him. They've, they've just thrown what he's done back in, their, back in his face. And so on that day, they will have to face the wrath of the Lamb. And you notice that the word wrath is used here twice. So the day of judgment is not going to be an impassionate day. God is not indifferent to people's sin and their attitudes towards him. This is going to be a day of righteous and holy anger and fury. And so people call out in verse 17, and they call out and they say that... The great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Who can stand? What a question. Can you stand? Will you be able to stand on that day? Who can stand in the presence of a perfectly holy God? Who has never done anything wrong in their lives? Who is perfectly innocent? Who is completely holy and righteous? No one. And yet here's the thing. The things that normally fill our minds and that we get most worried about, we get most worried about, are are usually all the things to do with the first five seals of the scroll. Generally, the things that we most worry about in life are relationships or conflicts or whether we've got enough money or not to live, are the future of our children, our health, the thought of dying. Usually, it's, it's those things that just dominate our minds. And, and we think to ourselves, well, well how am I going to cope if I've not got enough money to pay my bills? Or or how am I going to cope if I'm diagnosed with this really serious illness? And and, and yet here we're being shown in the question in verse 17 is, is, is that it's not the first five seals that we should be worried about. It's it's the sixth seal. Uh, the, The question is not so much how am I going to cope on the day of illness? No, the question is, how am I going to stand on the day of God's holy wrath? How am I going to stand before his throne when Jesus comes to judge? And so I ask again, what will that day be like for you? How are you hoping to stand? What are you putting your confidence in? Are you just hoping that God will be nice and just let you off in spite of the way in which you've treated him and everyone else? Are you hoping that all of your good works will outweigh your bad and that somehow you have worked yourself into God's good books? If if, if you are, just think again. Because no one will be able to stand before God's holy throne on that basis. And yet the reason why this chapter ends with this question, the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand, is because if you look over the page and in chapter 7 and in verses 9 and 10, we're given an answer. There are people who can stand on that day. And it's all those who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. It's all those who have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, if Jesus is your only hope, if you are looking to Jesus, and and he alone is your confidence, and you put your trust in him, 
And, and, and you know God's forgiveness and, and God has given to you Jesus' perfect righteousness. Here you see very clearly that you are eternally safe. You are eternally safe and you will be able to stand on that day because Jesus is your refuge and your shelter. And, and how much we want to glorify and praise our beautiful Lord Jesus Christ who laid down his life and shed his blood that we might be able to stand before a holy God and be safe. And if Jesus is not your savior this morning, you need to trust in him. You need to trust in him before it's too late. And before the sixth seal is opened and the Lord Jesus Christ comes in eternal and final judgment and before you are crying out to the rocks and the mountains to fall on you and cover you and hide you because you cannot cope with the face of him who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. And Jesus, he's calling you today and he's inviting you. He's holding out his arms to you. And he is calling you to come to him and to find peace and shelter and a place of safety for all eternity in him as you shelter under his precious blood. And Jesus, he can do that for you this morning. He can do that for you now. And he calls you to come to him today.